Yes, please remember. Words of wisdom. I've only been at this a little while, but that's a quick lesson to learn. I wanted to share something. I really, really appreciate seeing these, these young ones getting involved in the ministry here. They're running around with their Bibles trying to get signatures and, and coming up here and doing the readings. And, and these readings are tough, by the way. Uh, this, this chapter here is a tough chapter to read. Uh, any of them, actually, for that matter. But it's great to see little kids getting involved in the ministry. And this is a very important piece of it, just getting up in front of people like you and reading like that. Uh, but if you think you can do it, talk to your pastor. Um, <laughs> I want to share a story, though, that I, that I think fits in with this. And then we'll pray and we'll get on with the message. But I don't know if it was last year. Or, this is a, a Brother Knox story. Um, I don't know if it was last year or the year before he was, he was at a church and, and preached. And, and we had dropped him off and we were on our way home. I think it was my wife and I. And my son was in the back. And he's probably going to remember this story. And um, he was talking, he said, I really love Brother Knox. I wish he was my pastor. He's much funnier than my dad. So I grounded him. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, here, here's the thing. I, I, I didn't grow up going to church like these young people are here. And I had none of that. I didn't get saved until I was in my late 20s, so I didn't have any of this. And I, I can't tell you, especially from the men's perspective, how important it is to be a role model to these young kids. And, and preachers in particular, you, you play a very important role in these young people's lives. Um, you know, a lot of preachers are leaving the ministry, and my heart breaks because of it. And, and we're losing a lot of older preachers. They're going home to be with the Lord. And, and we're losing, there's a gap, and that gap seems to be widening of you know, that wisdom and experience and, and that example. And I think in the Bible, Paul said, be ye followers of me. But it doesn't end there. He said, be ye followers of me as I am a Christ. And one thing that we need to do, I, I believe, as men, and I, I think it was appropriately said yesterday, we're not man bun guys, we're not skinny jean guys, and we don't have a man purse. We carry a three fifty seven, and we go hunting for moose, and we take our kids fishing, and we got the, you know, you do the whole thing. I'm not going to go down the whole road there, but you, you do man things, right? You pick things up, put them down, you know. I, I, I've never gotten into crochet or anything, but I guess, I don't know, there's something there that'll kind of help you. Not against crochet, ladies. All right. <laughs> All right, I'm going to bury myself a really big... <laughs> Dig myself a big ditch this morning, uh, this evening rather. Uh, let's pray and we're going to get on uh, with this fellow here, Nebuchadnezzar, and, and uh, we're going to talk about how he got saved. I know there's some disagreement there, so I did some polling and I found out that there's quite a few people that believe he did, so I'm in good company here. So uh, I'm sure Brother James will come up and he'll have his commentary and that's fine too. <laughs> all right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this night. Lord, I just thank you so much uh, for all these people here. There's just been so much kindness. And a lot of folks from the Northeast moved down here. I, I, I've met so many folks uh, these past couple of days, and they've been so great. Lord, I thank you for the preachers that are here. And, and what an encouragement these men have been to me. And uh, Lord, I thank you for their example in that regard. I thank you for their preaching and their faithfulness. Uh, Lord, I thank you for these preachers that have been in the ministry for the long haul. Uh, what a testimony, what an example that is. And and, uh, Lord, I pray tonight, uh, as weak as I am uh, in the flesh, uh, Lord, with my limitations, uh, God, I pray your spirit will speak through the word that's spoken here today, that it will be an encouragement to your people, Lord, that we can walk closer to you, uh, Lord, that we can be encouraged and strengthened by your Holy Spirit, uh, Lord, that we can live that life of joy that we're called to live, and that we can be an example of uh, not only to one another, but to these young people as well, that they can see godly men and godly women uh, living out a life of holiness, uh, Lord, just, just rejoicing in the Spirit and, and listening and applying themselves to the truth. And uh, Father, I thank you again and ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, Nebuchadnezzar has been addressed quite a bit over the last couple of days. So I was thinking I might do a little Coin A New England uh, talk here and talk about uh, what a wicked bad dude uh, this Nebuchadnezzar was. 
Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, as you know, up to this point, um, he had gained quite a bit of power. Uh, as the tree illustration uh, outlines, he had basically conquered the known world. And he ended up with britches that were a little too big for him. And at the end of the day, what happened with him, God had to send his man into his life to let him know, Nebuchadnezzar, you're not in charge. Nebuchadnezzar, you don't have a say in all this matter. I'll set kings up and I'll bring them down. That's the whole point of the chapter. And so Nebuchadnezzar had to learn a lesson, a very important lesson on who was in control. What's the application to us? I think sometimes we have to learn who's in control. I think sometimes we get ahead of God. I think sometimes we think we want to do our own plans with God. And we get ahead and say, wow, look what I did. And look what the, look at the church that I built. And look at the things that I did. And then God comes in and wipes the whole thing flat. And that thing will happen. How many ministries have been taken down? How many TV ministries, how many TV evangelists have gone down the wrong road? Why? Because they're big and they're famous. They got ahead of themselves. They got ahead of God. And God cut them down. And old Nebuchadnezzar, he got cut down pretty bad. You know, I think with God, I think the interesting thing, it doesn't matter where you are in your, your walk with the Lord. It doesn't matter what position you are. It doesn't matter if you're an evangelist. It doesn't matter if you're a new Christian. God has just the right form of punishment to bring you down. But what I want you to see with that, because God will punish everybody, or chastise, or discipline, whatever you want to call it. If you want to dress it up and make it fancy, that's fine. It's, God's going to accomplish His will in your life one way or another. But what I want you to understand is no matter what he does, wherever you're at, the outcome is always going to be the same. And the outcome is to bring him honor and glory. That was the whole point of this. Look at verse number 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones. Right? Now watch this. To the intent... If, if there's going to be an anchor verse in this entire chapter, this is it. To the intent of what? That the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. That's the intent of the whole chapter, is to bring God into view. The preacher said the other night, God is able. Amen. He is. But now we come to this matter, and this is this, this chapter is a little bit awkward because it starts off with basically his testimony, his retrospect, if you will. I want you to see this in the first three verses here. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. That's number one. Notice, peace be, uh, be multiplied unto you. Number two, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. Number three, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, if Nebuchadnezzar is not saved, that's as good a testimony as I've seen in some Christians. In a lost man. Now, what I want to do here is I want to try to draw the application to us. Because we're saved, right? That was weak. Come on now. We're saved, right? All right. I mean, this is a Baptist church down south. I heard all you folks shout. I don't know. <laughs> right? So, listen. If you're saved, you're going to have a testimony. Amen? If you're saved, there's going to be a change in your life. Right? Well, look at Nebuchadnezzar. I'd say there's been a change. Here's a man that would chop your block off and throw you in the oven and not even miss a meal. You don't think they were afraid of him? You don't think they walked softly around him? And this guy gets, he gets right with God. He says, peace be multiplied unto you. You know, there's a fellow in the New Testament. He went out with his papers. He was hunting Christians. What did God do with him? Put him on his face. Right? And you know what? He got right right away, didn't he? Remember what he said? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You want to talk about a change? That's it. That's the change. It's not a matter of, well, 
it's conditional, Lord. Okay, I'll get saved, but mm, you know, I'm going to hold back here, and we'll do a few things here, and we'll work, a, we'll work a deal together. No, it's you get saved, and you take up your cross daily, and you follow the Lord. At least that's the way I understand the Bible. There's a change, and it was a change toward those people that Nebuchadnezzar had. You know what? That puts it in our laps that we need to have a change towards people too. I, I wasn't always saved. I, didn't, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't get saved till my late 20s. I wasn't a very nice person. But God got inside of me, and through process of time, He's helped me to be a nice person. And to love on people. And not love on the lovable people. Right? Sometimes there's some not-so-lovable people. And we have to be faithful to them as we do the lovable people. I know, everyone's like, oh, wait a minute, now, you, you, now you, you're being accusatory. Am I? Do, do we not pick and choose? We, we do that. If we have Christ in us, uh, what's it say in Ephesians? It's one of the, one of the six or seven walks me- mentioned in Ephesians. Walk in love. As God has loved you. That's it. There's a change. Nebuchadnezzar had a change. He said, peace to all. He said, peace be multiplied unto you. Can you imagine what they must have felt like? Nebuchadnezzar. What is it? What is up with this guy? Didn't that happen to so many of you when you got changed? You went home and you told folks how you got saved and you're loving on the Lord and you quit all your bad habits and you're loving on them. You're not fussing and fighting with them anymore. You're like, wow. Yeah, that's the power of God. You know what happened here also? I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that a high God hath wrought toward me. Boy, I'll tell you, I listen to preachers and I listen to uh, folks that get saved and talk about their testimonies and great things that God has done for you. Your testimony is the most important thing. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't be uh, uh, ashamed of your testimony. To tell people what God has done in your life. He's changed you. He's given you a new life and a new hope. You don't want to live that old life anymore. You're a new man in Christ. You're putting to death that old man. Setting your affections on things above. God has changed me. I'm not that same person anymore. Paul got saved. He's a changed person. They're like, Paul, he's the one that was persecuting the Christians. He's preaching the gospel now. What a wonderful thing. That's the power of God. There's change. Don't be afraid to tell people the great things that God has done in your life. They desperately need to hear that from you. The world doesn't know the power of God, but you do. And Daniel knew it. And Daniel was willing to go to great lengths to make sure Nebuchadnezzar knew it. Several times, actually. Nebuchadnezzar was a bit of a stubborn individual, but God, God's patient. He works with people. He'll break you. You're not going to win against God. Don't even try. But notice this in verse number 3. Notice the praise. Notice the praise. How great are His signs. How mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And His dominion is from generation to generation. Wow, what a praise that is. Now, as you remember, well, I'm not going to get too far into the story here. He was warned in this section. You'll hear a little bit more when Brother Travis comes up. But he was warned. He was warned. You better get yourself right with God. Or you're going to be in the field eating grass. God gives out a warning. I really believe that. If God gives a warning. We, we're, we're fortunate. We have the book in our lap. We have the warning from God. When you hear to preach and get up and preach, you get a warning from God. Before I got saved, I got lots of warnings from God. I had people in my life, I didn't know who these people were. I didn't know what denomination they were from. All I knew was there were people in my life that came up, they gave me a track here, they opened up a Bible here. I met somebody at the Worcester Gallery, it's closed down now, they had an open Bible and shared with me the gospel. I had no idea what that was. I had people that were willing to share with me, but I wasn't willing to get it right. And finally I did, and what a change, and the first thing that happened to me was I stopped giving the guy that I worked with a hard time. I wasn't very nice. And sometimes I'm on the receiving end of that, and I understand. There's been a change. You bear up with those things. 
Some of you folks have been there as well. We need to acknowledge who is in control. He is, his is an everlasting kingdom. It's not ours. It's His. And it's perfectly up to Him to do whatever He decides He wants to do. I will say this, getting political here just briefly. I am thankful that Trump got in. I praise the Lord that woman didn't. She hates Christianity. She does. She's a mean, wicked woman. But, yeah. Now, I don't know if Trump's saved. Now, the, the preacher mentioned this morning, just a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here and eventually to get saved. I don't know. There's a lot of people in Trump's life right now that are opening a Bible up. They're praying. They're influencing him. And as Brother Knox noted, if that man with all his boldness and fury gets saved, whoa, you better hang on. <laughs> wow. Twitter will light up. <laughs> I'll tell you. All right. <laughs> now, <laughs> all right. Now, number four. Uh, verse four, please. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. What can I say? He was at rest. He had nothing else to fear. He had thought he had accomplished everything that he needed to accomplish. He wasn't concerned or worried about anything. You would have thought that Nebuchadnezzar would have learned his lesson. Didn't he have a dream before? We talked about that this morning, didn't we? But he's at rest again. He's a hard-hearted man. But aren't, aren't we sometimes like that? Don't we sometimes get into a place in our life where we're kind of at rest? I, look, in Christianity, okay, I believe Jesus. Okay, I got baptized. All right, I read my Bible. I'm good. Is it really that easy? Do you really just kind of stop? If you think it's that easy, talk to your pastor. Take him into his office and have a conversation with him and ask him if he ever stopped. I know he doesn't. You can't build a church like this and, and be idle and comfortable and at ease. That's not the way it works. We're to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. We're never at rest. I think it says over in Romans, Awake thou that sleepest. And I think there's, a, there's somebody here had mentioned something to me or something in conversation about apathy in Christianity. And uh, the, that, that verse over there in, in Romans, Awake thou that sleepest. I think we need to be awake. I think this is an opportunity for us right now to come out of our rest and our slumber. We've got folks that are dying in their sin and they're on their way to hell. We need churches planted. I talked to two folks tonight that are praying about possibility of planting a church. Praise the Lord. We need some of these young men stepping up and going out. I know they're moving here to go to the Bible school, but let's kick them out and get them planting churches, right? No offense, brother, but I mean, that's what you want to do. Now, here's the, other, here's the other thing I want you to think about now. That's just from our perspective as Christians, to always be alert, to always be growing, to always be moving forward. But what about the lost? Do they not come to a place of ease and comfort in their life? Oh, i got a good job. I've got a good home. I've got a good family. I've heard this dozens of times when I talk to people. Well, I don't need God in my life because I have everything I need. Nebuchadnezzar had everything. He conquered the known world. That was the whole illustration of the tree. They were in fear. They didn't want their head chopped off. What was he afraid of? Nothing. And then God comes on the scene, and he sends him a dream, as the preacher pointed out, just, boom, put that word right in his head. I'll tell you, the word does that. It's true. Do you ever quote scripture without quoting a reference? to a lost person and they know you're quoting scripture? Isn't that remarkable? You can quote the most obscure, non-offensive verse in the Bible and they'll come at you like, quit quoting that scripture! You know why that is? And I believe this with all my heart. The word is living. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing son of soul and spirit and joint and marrow. I believe that. All you have to do is quote scripture. It's like a sword. Just cut that thing right up. Right? 
We have the living, breathing Word of God right here. So he's at rest. God comes, in, comes on the scene. I, I saw a dream which made me afraid. That's good. That's a good place, amen? I, I mean, how else is a lost person ever going to get saved unless there is a level of fear of God? Right? So what do we, what do we do? We soft pedal the gospel. We ease them in. I think we've gotten away from some important biblical truths that we should be preaching to folks, right? I mean, where are they going to go when they die? They're not going to limbo. They're not going to have a party. They're going to go to a fiery hell where the smoke from their torment is going to ascend up forever and ever. There will be no joy, no peace, no hope, no love, nothing but misery and pain and separation from God. There needs to be a level of fear. But then when they get saved, perfect love does what? Casteth out fear. So he was troubled. I think it's good. I think it's good to get people troubled. The preacher talked about that, just handing out the track. You know what? Sometimes just giving that person a track will trouble them. Why do you think they resist that? They don't want the track. I, I've seen people, and those of you that are engaged in street ministry, you, you know what I'm talking You You try to give people a track. It's a piece of paper. It, right? It's a piece of paper. And, and they, they completely lose their minds when you give them a piece of paper. Why? Because it's what it says. You can give them the track that says God loves you, and they still come unglued. There's something about that that troubles them. There's a quickening, I believe, that goes on in the conscience and the hearts and minds of lost people. And when they are confronted with the truth, what did Paul say when the law came? Sin revived, right? There's something about God's law that revives sin in people. They don't want to be reminded that they're living in sin. They don't want to be reminded that eternity is an awful long time. Someday, you're going to die. You know, when I read the story, I think it's John 11, when Jesus is dealing with the whole Lazarus thing. He, he, it says, Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. He spoke plainly. Sometimes we need to do just that. Speak plainly. But Lazarus came forth from the grave. And we're coming forth from that grave. Amen? Amen. All right. So, he's troubled. Now, the next thing you'll see him do here, verse number 6, Therefore made I a decree. Here we go again. We just learned this in the previous chapters. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Here we go. Then come in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. The world has a default switch. They have a place where they're going to go to find their source of comfort. King Nebuchadnezzar did bring in the astrologers, bring in the wise men, bring in the soothsayers. They're going to answer my questions concerning this dream. When you deal with people in the world, they have their default button. I call it secular humanism. Break it down like this. Secular humanism, science, and philosophy. You know what secular humanism does? It says man is the measure of all things. That's the sum total of secular humanism. Man is the measure of all things. We don't need a supernatural God to tell us what to do. We don't need a supernatural God to tell us what is moral and what isn't moral. We don't need a supernatural God to dictate to us what's going to happen in the afterlife. Man is the measure of all things. You know, there, there are several of these guys that, that come up in this uh, in a study on humanism. And one of them was uh, Nietzsche. Frederick Nietzsche came out during the, pretty much the age of reason, the age of enlightenment. A lot of bad things happened during that time. That's when higher criticism began to take root. Uh, the graph wellhausen theory, and then all the questions about authorship came on the scene. Daniel's not the only book 
whose authorship is questioned, Genesis is questioned as well, parts of Isaiah, and a number of other books. Jonah, I think, is another one. So these Nietzsche, he, uh, he, he had a, a bright mind, and then he lost his mind. Those of you that studied him out, uh, he, he lost his mind. He, he wrote something uh, that Hitler tried to model in his philosophy, his Superman uh, philosophy. But he also said that God is dead. That's what Nietzsche said. Well, I'm here to tell you that Nietzsche has changed his mind. These are the guys that they're relying on. These are the guys that they're going to to try and find comfort and hope. The other one, a fellow by the name of Descartes. Here's his brilliant statement. You ready for this? This is going to help you out. Okay, you ready? I think, therefore I am. How's that? That'll help you out with your finances, right? That'll help you out when you deal with something physical, right? When you're going through some emotional struggles, I think, therefore, I am. All right, we're ready to go. We're not going to help you on your deathbed, though. Not going to help you with dealing with the loss of a loved one. Nope. There's another fella. I don't have a whole list here. I just have a couple. Socrates. Ready now? This is going to help you out a lot. The only thing I know is that I know nothing. I wonder how he knew that. (laughs) I don't know. He used to think. Look at (laughs) it. What does the Bible say? The wisdom of this world is what? Foolishness. You're always going to win with the Word of God. You may not all understand all this philosophy stuff and this humanism stuff. The Word of God will always win. Now, the, the next thing that comes on the... On the scene here, they talk about science. So humanism says science is the answer to all things and everything else. And I, I've debated with these people. They say, oh, Christians, uh, religion has killed more people than science. So I like to think about things. So who was it that invented the nuclear bomb? Was, that, was, that, was there any science involved in that? I, I don't know. How about chemical warfare? Think science was involved in that? Probably. Who was the beast that came up with abortion? Right? I mean, we're on the bad side of that because we believe in God. These people come up with this kind of stuff. That's sick. Abortion's sick. That's, that's the byproduct of a deranged, sick mind. Period. You know what humanism says? Humanism says to you and I that we need a crutch. Now, let me tell you something. I need a crutch. When you, think, when you think of somebody on a crutch, they're leaning on it, aren't they? Because there's a weakness... There's something hurting. There's a bone out of joint. And you're leaning on that crutch. Because you need help. Is there a hymn? Lean? I'm not going to sing it because you'll, you'll throw me out. <laughs> I think it goes, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Thank you. Okay. I won't torture you with that. Look, I have been there and I know many of you have been there. I have a lot of books on my bookshelf. I read a lot of books, a lot of different kinds of books, but I find the most comfort in the Word of God. Yes. Romans 15, verse number 4, there's comfort and hope in the Scriptures. You, you can't find this kind of hope in philosophy. You can't find that kind of hope in science. You can't find that kind of hope in humanism, but you can find it in the Word of God, and you can find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lean on Him. You'll always come out on the winning side with Jesus. Now, notice what happens here. Daniel says, uh, or it says here, but at the last, but at the last. Why is it that God is always last? 
God's last here. Why is God always last with us? Right? We go through the process and we, we do our checks and balances. And then, oh, by the way, what does God have to say about this? Oh, let me check the Bible. Or let me check with the pastor. And by the time you get to the pastor, you got yourself in such a deep mess. Sometimes. I don't say all the time, but sometimes. Why does God always have to be last? Why not put Him first? And that's what happened here. At the last, who came in? Daniel. Who's Daniel? Daniel's the man of God. And look what it says in the verse. Verse 9. O Belshazzar, master of the magicians. Now watch. See what it says here? Now watch. Because I heard... Is that what it says? You reading that with me? What's it say? Because I know. Not because he heard. There's a difference. He knew. Well, how did he knew that? Know that, knew that. Boy, I messed that up, didn't I? (laughs) That's humbling. How did he know that? Consistent testimony by Daniel. We talked about finishing or starting well and continuing. A consistent testimony. At first, you may not have success. You'd be surprised at the people that you can minister to that you didn't think you could minister to. And I'm sure you've met up with folks like that in your life where you just keep pressing on and pressing on and pressing on and try, and all of a sudden, hey, Jack, Why don't you come over for coffee? I've got some things I need to discuss with you. And I know that you're a good Christian because you go to church and and you're good at work and you never cuss and you're always reading your Bible and you're always praying over your food. And Jack's a guy that wasn't even on your radar. But Jack's going through some problems, much like Nebuchadnezzar is. He's got some troubles. And he's gone to the defaults in his life. And they've all come up short. But he knows you love the Lord and have joy in your life. And he wants a piece of that. So he's going to meet with you in private, probably. And you're going to be ready to give a reason of the hope that you have within you with meekness and fear. We have to be prepared... To do that. And to do that, we have to have a good, solid testimony. And that's what Daniel had. Let's uh, move ahead of here a little bit. Talk about verse number 17, just briefly again. Verse number 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, those angels coming down. He says seven times pass over in verse number 16, that's seven years. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the holy, uh, by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basis of men. We, we, we talked a little bit about this early. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but here's, here's, here's God's whole plan to exalt himself. Here's God's whole plan. He wants Himself to be known. We have an obligation and responsibility not to take any of that credit for ourselves, but to give all that honor and all that glory to God. His intent here was to break Nebuchadnezzar down to such a degree that at the end of all of that thing, God would get the glory. You're here saved today. It's not your glory you're saved. That's God's glory. Saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. That's His glory. I'm saved by the grace of God, not by getting baptized, not by my works, nothing. I'm saved by the grace of God. Believe in the gospel. The work that's going on here is to God's glory and honor. The work going on at Bible Way Baptist Church in Auburn, Mass. is to God's glory and honor. And all the churches that are represented here, God's glory and honor. And as I, as I started to talk about when I, when I preached on Wednesday morning, uh, with, with regards to Daniel, it doesn't matter what's going on or who's in charge. 
here, physically, in this realm, ultimately, as the preacher mentioned last night, God's in control. Even if she won. But I'm thankful he did. Because he's in control, right, brother? <laughs> All right. All right, I got to move on. All right, let's move ahead here. I want to look at verse number 23. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This tree represented all that he controlled. Gentile nations. The Lord came in, cut that thing down, but the Lord didn't remove it entirely. He left a stump. So at some point in the future, that is going to be restored. But notice the band around the stump. God's protective band. Did some research on it. There's a lot of different opinions on it, but a couple of the tree websites that I went on, when they put that band around there, it's to prevent rot and cracking. He wanted to preserve it. And even though we may come to a place in our life where God cuts us down, He doesn't completely remove us. He leaves enough left and protects what's left to build us back up again. He restores us in His image and His glory. I thank God that He's not going to completely destroy me. He's going to take me down a few notches. He's going to humble me a little bit, or a lot, depending on what I, what, what I need. But He's never going to completely destroy me. He will keep me from falling. Amen? Amen? And that's what He did with Nebuchadnezzar. Let's move on here. Verse 25, That they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee. Seven years. Now watch what he says here. Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man and giveth it to whomsoever. Till thou know. How long is God going to keep me in this trial? Till thou know. How long am I going to have to endure this? Till thou know. Till you learn the lesson. But pastor, it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. Until you know. Sometimes we're in the middle of that thing. We don't understand why. And we don't go out of our way to find out why. God's putting the pressure on us to try and get us to learn a lesson. So that we can grow a little bit more with the Lord. Till thou know. And then here in verse 27. We'll, we'll break it off right here. Yeah, the word break is in there. Verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities, by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. What I want you to focus on here is that word, break off thy sins. Uh, we, we talk about repentance, but I like the use of the word break there. Right? I, I, I'm going to share something with you. All right? Back in the day, when I was younger, I smoked cigarettes. It was a foul, wicked habit, by the way. I know, I was, <gasps> hear the awes. It was a dirty, rotten habit. And those of you that have tried to deal with that habit or have dealt with that habit know what I'm about to say. It's a hard habit to what? Break. But that's the only way is to break it. Don't dabble in it. Don't play around with it. Break it. When I, when I was smoking, I was a Christian. I had some things to learn. So one day I was sitting outside on the dock where I worked. Mind you, I was a professing Christian. A lost man came out to me and said, some Christian you are, smoking a cigarette. Talk about break? <laughs> yeah. Because I love Jesus. It wasn't worth it. And that goes with any any sin. Don't play with it. Break it. And that's what he's telling Nebuchadnezzar here. Just break it. 
Break off thy sins by righteousness. That's the contrast. His sin, his righteousness. Go with the righteousness all the time. Show mercy to the poor. Obviously, he was kind of bad at that. So there's the turnaround, right? Show mercy to the poor. And look what God promises him, and then I'll end it. If it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. I believe Nebuchadnezzar got right with God. And I believe this chapter points that out to us. Strong, powerful testimony. God all, God help us all to be much like Him. Now let's pray. Father, thank You so much for this time, this opportunity to preach. I pray that the Word was an encouragement. God, I thank You for giving me the ability to be able to speak tonight. I pray for the preacher that's going to be coming up soon, Brother Travis. Lord, that You be with him. Put Your words in his mouth that our hearts and our minds will be encouraged through his preaching. Lord, may our time of fellowship together be uh, honoring and glorifying to you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.